Now this is kind of a quick introduction to uh, rates of reaction and we did this in class with light sticks and light sticks are perfect for this because you can see how fast the reaction is going by how bright the light stick is. Now when we were doing this we found out that some people really didn't have some ideas about you know why light sticks work. So we asked three questions. One is you know you know that you have to take a light stick and snap it and shake it to get it to go but why is it that you need to snap it? Second question, how long do they last? And third question, are they always the same brightness? So stop the tutorial, think about that for a moment, and then we'll talk. Okay, first question, why do you have to snap it? Well, if you've ever looked really, really closely at a light stick, you'll see inside there is a little bit of a glass tube and it's a little hard to see a lot of times but here it is here okay so there's a glass tube and in that glass tube there's one chemical right inside there and the other chemical is around it so when you snap it you break the glass so that the two chemicals can mix so that's actually the answer to our first question here why do you have to snap it you want to snap it so you can mix the chemicals Second question, how long do they last? And people had a lot of different answers, and some people said that if you put a light stick into the freezer, that'll make it last longer. Okay, so that was an important idea. But how long do they last? It really depends. Some of the light sticks say that they're 12-hour light sticks. I think that's what these say in the picture. Some are 8-hour light sticks. And actually, the ones we used in class, they are marked 5-minute light sticks. So they don't last all that long, but they actually last about 45 minutes, so they're kind of mislabeled. The last thing, are they always the same brightness? And no, everybody kind of agrees they're really kind of bright to start with, and the brightness gets less and less and less over time. Now, our question here is, if you had a light stick, and let's say it lasts for maybe six hours, how much of the chemical gets used up in about ten minutes? So you want to take your, your worksheet and kind of just on this pie chart, make a pie wedge of how much chemical do you think gets used up in 10 minutes. And this is not a calculation question. This is just sort of a gut reaction question. So take a moment and write something down. Now in class, we had some people that said, oh, I think we need a great big pie wedge. I think that a lot of this stuff gets used up uh, right away in 10 minutes or some people said no I think it's a maybe about a quarter a little bit less some people thought it's a tiny 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 little sliver like this okay some people thought something kind of medium okay so we're gonna go back here and we'll just say well let's just say about this much and the, actually the re answer is I really don't know okay how much chemical you have to use up and the idea though is everybody pretty much agreed that not all of the chemical does get used up Okay, just some fraction of the chemical gets used up in 10 minutes. So that brings us to our next question, and we want to kind of get a mental model of this, and that is, if only some of the chemical gets used up, what is preventing all the other chemical in here to get used up? What's, what's going on with all this chemical? Why isn't it getting used up, uh, you know, in the first 10 minutes? And another part of that is, if you had... Uh, maybe let's say 10% of the chemicals being used up, how does the chemicals know which 10% are supposed to react? What keeps the other 90, you know, what do, why don't the other 90% react? So think about that for a few moments. Pause the tutorial and we'll start up again and talk. Now one of the ideas for this is that the particles really do need to collide into each other. So let's say we have a chemical like this, okay, and we've got another chemical like this, okay, they have to bump into each other in order to react. And so we finally kind of come up with the idea, well, not only do they have to bump into each other, but they pretty much have to bump into each other hard enough to cause some bonds to break and new ones to form. So they got to bump into each other and they have to bump into each other hard enough. So, our model then says, let's look at the kinetic energy distribution, and we know kinetic energy is the energy of motion, and so some of the particles are going to go really fast, and some are going slowly, and a lot are going medium. So, if we do a graph of kinetic energy, where the right side of the graph are high energy particles, left side is low energy particles, 
then we can see we'll probably get some kind of a little distribution, maybe like a little bell curve. So some particles have high energy, some have low, some have medium. And the ones that are going to react, let's say we can arbitrarily put a line and say you have to have at least this much energy in your collision to react. We're going to give that a name. We're going to call that the threshold energy. So that's the lowest energy that two particles can collide with and still have a reaction. Now, that kind of explains then what's going on in our pie graph, that if only these particles are reacting, those are the ones that happen to be hitting each other hard enough that they can react. The rest, they just bump into each other and just, you know, bounce off. Now, our next question four is, what would you think would happen if we took one light stick and put it in hot water, and we took another one and put it in cold water? So think about that for a moment. Now in class, people say, okay, in the hot water, the uh, light stick would get brighter, but it wouldn't last very long. And in cold water, it would get dimmer, but it should last longer. And we're going to try that out. Okay, so here we do is we have, uh, here we have hot water. Okay, here we have cold water. And we can see what happens. The light stick does. It gets very bright. Okay. And also, you're right, it doesn't last all that long. So by the end of the period, it was totally dead. Okay, the one that's cold, okay, that gets dimmer, but it did last longer. You know, it just stayed, even at the end of the period, it was still going. So we're going to go back and kind of add to our model now. So if we had, okay, chemicals at a higher temperature, what would that look like on our kinetic energy graph? And if we have chemicals at lower energy, what would that look like? So going back here, so with our red, how would we show higher energy particles? Well, this is kind of an odd graph. It's a left-right graph rather than an up-down graph. And so what we need to do is to kind of draw our graph more to the right, but sort of spread out. Okay, so we still have some low energy particles, but now we have more high energy particles. So we have more particles over the threshold energy. That's why the, the reaction would go brighter, but not last as long. If it was colder, it would be taller, but more to the left. So now only these few particles would have enough energy. And that's what happened. If you put the, the um, light stick into the freezer, okay, then it would really cool it down. So only a few particles would be able to react. Now, when we did this, we also had one light stick, okay, and that was just at room temperature, and that one was just so we can use it as a comparison. That was question number six. Now, the big question comes up then, and that is, why do these particles have to collide hard enough to react? And for that, we get another graph. So now we're on to question seven and eight. And the idea here is, if we have particles, let's say at this energy, this potential energy to start with, so those are the chemicals before they react. After they react, they give off light. So do they have higher energy or lower energy? And people decided that if you're giving off light, which is energy, you must end up at lower energy. And that's exactly right. But why don't all the particles react? And the reason they don't all react is that there must be some kind of an energy barrier between the reactants and the products. So we have an energy barrier. So the particles in the beginning, okay, have to collide into each other hard enough to get over that barrier to turn into the products, turn into low energy products. And so some of the energy here is given off in the form of light. Okay. Now, on question nine, we're saying, okay, we have a name for this. And the energy, the energy it takes to get from the reactants to the top of that is called the activation energy, E sub A. So let's go fill that in. So between the reactants and products, there's an energy barrier. The energy needed to go from the reactants to the top of the barrier is called the activation energy. Now, how do they get this energy? They get this energy by colliding into each other. So they can use their kinetic energy to get their potential energy they need to get over that barrier. 
Let's go back and look at that. We're saying that what happens is particles, as a reactants, they may be something like this. Maybe they are, you know, a big particle like this and a little particle like this. Okay, they come colliding into each other. And if they collide hard enough, they can turn into products. And a product might be a big particle, little particle, and another big particle, little particle. But in between here, they have to form their activated complex, which would be something like a big particle, big particle, small particle, small particle, all together. And that in-between molecule is very unstable, very high potential energy. So the particles need to collide into each other really hard so they can form this activated complex, this in-between, and then they can turn into the products. And in-between they give off some light. So the particles collide and they train in their kinetic energy for their potential energy. Now there's a chemical that you can put in and what it does is that it uh, makes the reaction go faster but doesn't get used up in that reaction. And people seem to know that that's called a catalyst. So what a catalyst does is it takes and it lowers that barrier. Now how does it do that is not really clear all the time. Sometimes it's just the surface provided makes that work better. Sometimes it actually gets involved in the reaction. But you can see what happens is that if we have this high barrier for the blue curve, okay, then you're going to have to hit each other pretty hard in order for that to happen. But if you have the red one involved, then you get this lower barrier, easier, more particles are able to react. Now, our last question is how do these two graphs go together? We had this other graph about kinetic energy, and we have kinetic energy distribution and particles that can react. And what happens is if we take that picture, the kinetic energy, and draw it sideways, then we can see what happens is this is kinetic energy. And this one here is potential energy. So the particles that have high kinetic energy, then they can react. So you have to have at least that much energy to react. But if you get if you're here with the uh, with the catalyst, then that lowers this activation energy, that lowers our threshold energy. So even particles with just this much energy when they collide, they are going to be able to react. So where would this kind of show up? And that is maybe if we had an eight hour light stick, it might be this uh, blue situation. Because now you have to hit each other really hard to, to do this. And maybe more our five minute light stick might be something with a catalyst inside so that more of the particles can react. Now that's the kind of ideas we do with this, with this re uh, worksheet. And uh, the other questions, a set of homework questions, 13, 14, 15, we actually didn't do those in the classes here. So that's the end.